welcome to Greenophilia. I am Dr. Rajni and in today's episode I am going to talk about the fifth principle of green chemistry. The principle which tells us about the type of the solvents which we should use in our reactions to make them green. Uh, solvents are something which are used in bulk in the laboratory as well as in the industry. Uh, solvents no, are not only required to dissolve the reactants but they also change the chemo region stereoselectivity of the reaction. So uh, if we look carefully uh, like the solvents which we are using in the laboratory they are like dichloromethane, methanol, uh, toluene or acetone, acetone nitrile all of them they are volatile. So during workup or even if you try to recycle them some part of them goes to the environment and pollute it. And the other uh, drawback is that all of them they are derived from non-renewable resources. So because of their volatile nature and because of the, the, the source of these solvents, uh, they, are not, they cannot be considered as green. So we have to look for some greener alternatives so as to curb both of these problems or at least one of these problems. So the options which are uh, available the first is like going for solventless synthesis, solventless synthesis that is doing the synthesis uh, or carrying out the reactions without using a solvent which is possible in some cases and is, is not uh, we cannot apply the same thing for all the reactions. All the reactions cannot be, con cannot be performed under solventless conditions. So the next option is going for water. Water is a cheap alternative and we all know that it is a safer as well. But most of the time as an organic chemist uh, we think that no we cannot do reactions in water. But people have successfully uh, developed protocols where they have uh, performed the reactions in uh, aqueous media. The third is ionic liquids and the fourth one is supercritical fluids ionic liquids next is using supercritical fluids like carbon dioxide supercritical carbon dioxide supercritical carbon dioxide or supercritical fluids then we have fluorous solvents or perfluorous solvents fluorous media In today's episode, the focus would be on ionic liquids because of all uh, of the these classes that is supercritical fluids, fluorous media, ionic liquids and water. Ionic liquids, they have emerged as a promising alternative to the conventional uh, reaction media. All of them, uh, all of these, they are called non-conventional solvents or alternative solvents. So, uh, the, there are certain properties which makes ionic liquids a uh, promising alternative and we will discuss what are ionic liquids and what are those properties which have, uh, which have attracted the organic chemist towards the ionic liquids uh, as solvents. So going to the to explain ionic liquids I will take the example of sodium chloride which is the common salt which we use in our kitchen. So sodium chloride or the table salt or this one, uh, we all know that it is solid at room temperature and if you want to melt it, it will require, uh, because its melting point is uh, 801 degrees Celsius, so you require so much high temperature to melt it, uh, melt sodium chloride to be in the liquid form. Uh, but the other thing is that sodium chloride is not volatile. It's not like it's uh, it's in, in the solid state it doesn't sublime uh, and in the even if we melt it it's not going to vaporize. So if sodium chloride uh, would have been liquid at room temperature it would have uh, served our purpose to be used as a solvent which is non-volatile. So people looked for the alternatives and they found ionic liquids. So, um, if you go into the history of ionic liquids, it, uh, they are not the organic chemists uh, who actually looked for the ionic liquids. The history is somewhat different. 
Um, but uh, I will, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I will take this uh, topic from the perspective of an organic chemist. So what are ionic liquids? They are liquid salts, in simple words, liquid salts. So you can envision them as salts which are liquid at room temperature. Liquid salts, when I'm saying liquid salts, it, it, I'm talking about uh, them at room temperature. So ionic liquids are the salts whose melting point is below the boiling point of water at room temperature. Ionic liquids are the salts whose melting point is below the boiling point of water. Boiling point of water. And then wh what are they composed of? I know that sodium chloride is formed of sodium ions and chloride ions and they are forming a, they are having an ionic bond in between them. So wh what are ionic liquids chemically? So ionic liquids are composed of organic cations, organic cations, a combination of organic cation and inorganic anion in general, inorganic anion leads to the formation of an ionic liquid. The organic cation would be, I am um, taking the example of imidazolium cation, okay. Then it could be ammonium, the simplest one. Okay, and then we have other options as well like pyridinium. Inorganic ions may be chloride ion, nitrate, SO3 negative, um, then we have this um, NTF2 type ion, anion that is bisphenolamide. Oh, if I write it uh, uh, like that, it would be a negative. Yeah, bisphenolamide is, yeah, charge distribution is. Uh, Okay, then we have, this is the same as this one, NTF2, um, this triflamide. Then we have uh, hexafluorophosphate and we have uh, uh, tetrafluoroborate. So any of these can be combined with the other one and we can look for their properties. So the important property of ionic liquids is that they are non-volatile in general. They may be uh, they may be having some little vapor pressure, um, but in general we can say that they have a low vapor pressure. So by the suitable combination of or the uh, suitable selection of cation and anion, we can uh, synthesize n number of ionic liquids, uh, and the um, the important property is that they are designer solvents what's the meaning of that they're also called tailor-made solvents designer solvents so what's the meaning of that i'm going to the details of that they are called designer solvents now why they're called designer solvents because we can design the solvents uh, the ionic liquids as per the requirement of the reaction. Suppose I want to do a reaction in which I need a hydrophilic ionic liquid. So what I can do is, uh, suppose I'm taking imidazolium cation, so I will combine it with uh, tetrafluoroborate anion and it would lead to the formation of, the combination of these two would lead to the formation of a hydrophilic ionic liquid. Now for the other reaction, maybe I'm doing some like biphasic reaction in which I have water, as a solvent and I want to use the another uh, phase uh, which should be hydrophobic. Then I can combine the imidazolium cation with hexafluorophosphate anion. In that way it would be a hydrophobic ionic liquid. So by the suitable combination of cations and anions we can uh, synth synthesize the ionic liquid of our own choice. 
And the other thing is uh, important is like uh, the cation which you are choosing, it should be, uh, it should not be that much symmetrical because uh, we can uh, view it like, we can imagine it like the more uh, symmetrical a cation would be, the more efficiently it would pack into the lattice and the more efficient the packing would be the uh, the melting point would uh, increase so it would be like going towards sodium chloride rather than uh, forming an ionic liquid so it's very important i repeat it's like for an ionic liquid to be liquid at room temperature we should opt for the cations which are less symmetrical which are not that much symmetrical because the greater the symmetry the more would be the efficient packing of the uh, um, cations in the lattice and the more efficient would be the packing, the higher would be the melting point. So the substituents which we choose for these cations, they are generally um, chosen in a way that they should be different. Because if they are going to be the same, it would lead to a, it, it may uh, impart it as symmetry. And uh, the greater the size of the anion, the lower would be the melting point because the greater the size of the anion, the more would be like the there would be reduction in um, like uh, force of attraction. The, the lesser the um, force of attraction are there, the more non-coordinating type of the thing will result, and the more would be the uh, liquidus range of that ionic liquid, or the uh, lower would be the melting point of that ionic liquid. So this was about like how, uh, what are ionic liquids? Uh, they are the combination of organic cations and inorganic cations. And wh why they are called designer solvents or tailor-made solvents? Because we can choose the cation and an ion of our own choice to make the ionic liquid uh, which would serve the purpose for which we are designing that ionic liquid. And uh, now coming to the other properties of ionic liquids. The one is designer solvents. The and other properties are they have a low vapor pressure because of which they are not that much volatile so they don't pollute the environment. Low vapor pressure is an important one and uh, their polarity, viscosity, hydrophilicity, Hydrophobicity, and melting point can be tuned by judicious combination. A judicious choice of judicious choice of cation and anion. So that's why they are the designer solvents. The other thing is they have a huge liquidus range. Huge liquidus range. By liquidus range, I mean the span uh, of the temperature uh, during which the a substance. Uh, remains liquid. It's like the span between the melting and the boiling point of a liquid. So liquidus range is the span of the temperature in which the substance exists in the liquid phase. So they have a huge liquidus range. So we can use them as solvents uh, for a huge temperature range. They are thermally quite stable. So they can be used in thermally robust. Many of them they are uh, thermally robust. Or thermally stable because of which they can be used in the reactions which require high temperature of pressure. And they have a wide electrochemical window, wide electrochemical window, which means uh, by electrochemical window I mean like the potential range during which a substance is neither oxidized nor reduced. So, because of which they find applications in electrochemistry as well. So, this was about uh, the ionic liquids uh, and their properties. Now, how do we synthesize ionic liquids? 
we want to synthesize in the lab how we are going to synthesize the ionic liquids this their uh, synthesis is quite straightforward uh, it's like taking some I will just take the simple example of uh, synthesis of a general one a synthesis of ionic liquids synthesis of ionic liquids it's like taking some amine suppose i'm taking this amine uh, nr2 r dash or something and i'm taking this amine and i'm going to treat it with some alkyl halide i'm treating with some alkyl halide and obviously i'm going to get a quaternized uh, salt quaternary ammonium salt and x negative this is the salt this is the step one in the step one the uh, nucleophilic attack of uh, the amine onto the alkyl halide leads to the formation of quaternary ammonium salt and after this we can uh, by anion metathesis anion metathesis using a metal salt or uh, some acid we can do the anion metathesis by anion metathesis i mean that if i want to change the anion and i want to put the anion of my choice suppose uh, this is chloride and i want to make it pf6 so i will use a salt like uh, kpx6 potassium uh, hexafluoro phosphate or i want to use the borate then i will use uh, the salt containing the nbf1 negative so accordingly like i am using m positive a negative so by metathesis reaction i would get this thing a negative so this is my desired ion liquid this is the simplest way in which we can synthesize the ion liquids so that's all for this lecture uh in the next lecture we will talk about task specific ionic liquids uh or the functionalized ionic liquids thank you so much